Don, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Kim. All right, let's start off with why you were just recently censored on YouTube. You got a second strike. Um, what was it you said? You're a heavily censored person, but let's get to this. Yes. Let's talk about this latest strike, and then we'll talk about the previous times that you've been censored and why you've been censored. But what what happened this last time? Are you still in, well, kind of, uh, in under the strike right now with YouTube? Can anybody I watch you now? Think, I think yeah. my own podcast is later today at 5 p.m. A lot of times we don't know till that day and if it'll let us live stream there. So we'll see. Uh, probably. But uh, the latest one has to do with an interview I did six, seven years ago with Richard Gage, who Richard Gage used to be uh, the head of architects of engineer and engineers for 9-11 Truth. And it was just a you know, an interview about 9-11, they called it a hate speech. And I guess they looked at it after seven years or something and took it and they, they decided to uh, suspend my channel. Usually whenever I get strike, it's for something we said about COVID or vaccines. So yeah. I don't know why they so you know why they found that video, but it's pretty ridiculous to call that hate speech. So that's why seven I can't years. Live stream on YouTube. Uh, you know, yeah. it, with YouTube, I've been thinking about, and this kind of is, is compelling me to want to do this, but I've been meaning to delete all of my content except for the last three months, like only keeping about three months worth of content on it at a time and deleting everything. Because when they change the rule, this is what gets so ridiculous, is they'll change their rules. And then when they change their community guidelines and they don't really noti notify us of this, they then go back through all the videos, even if your video was yeah. compliant with the community guidelines at the time, but now it isn't. And so they say, we don't want this on our platform. And so we're going to give, it'd be one thing for them to just say, yeah, you did this before we changed the guideline. So we're just going to remove it. You know, we're just going to take it from our platform because we don't want it on the platform. But to give a strike when you didn't actually do anything wrong at the time, but now they're retroactively. I mean, that is just, it, yeah. you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. But what do you think you said in this 9-11 video? Were you talking, I mean, what was the premise or what was the conclusion that would lead them to well, say this was hate speech. It's been so it's been so long ago. I, I don't even remember. I'm sure we just talked about all the absurdities of the official story, and I, but it wasn't anything different than I've said in scores of other interviews, interviewing people or being interviewed myself. So I mean, I'm sure it was. You know, we're just talking about how the official story doesn't hold up. I don't know. They they don't say any said anything in particular, but it's just. I, I'm obviously not long for YouTube, but I don't think people are amazed I'm still there. So I'm trying to get somebody's helping me build up my Rumble channel over there to try to, uh, you know, be able to uh, use that more often because YouTube is just, you know, if you can't even talk about 9-11, I, you know, I don't I don't know what the, the point right. I have in it is. Did you implicate like the Israelis or something? I mean, that's just the only thing I could think of right now no. because they're super sensitive about no. anti-Semitism or pointing fingers at the Israelis. No, no, I, I'm I'm very careful about pointing. I mean, I talk about anything, but um, I'm very careful. I don't generalize, and I don't I don't say I know anything, Kim. You know, because when people say like even something like who killed JFK, man, I've been that's my rabbit. I mean, my um, my wheelhouse issue, and I started as a teenager investigating that in the mid 1970s with Mark Lane's group, the Citizens Committee of Inquiry, and I, they asked me who you know who who, well, who killed Kennedy. I said I, I don't know. I just know they, they did prove it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. So let's start from there. They lied to you, but I, I'm not going to sit there and tell you I can name the gunman. Same thing with 9-11. I don't know what happened, but I know it wasn't 19 crazed Arabs armed with box cutters and, and plastic knives flying around in our airspace for an hour and a half heading to the Pentagon who somehow none of the cameras were working that day when they had, you know, some, I mean, I know the official stories are, are, and that's what all my writing is about basically is showing that You've been lied to and they're not telling you the truth. That doesn't mean I necessarily know what the truth is, but I'm just trying to get people to realize that they've been lied to. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's uh, that's I think that's obvious. This kind of goes in with your recent book that you just released, American Memory Hole, how the court historians promote disinformation. So mm -hmm. it, recently what we've seen is, are, are you familiar with the podcast Martyr Made? Are you familiar with the controversy that's just recently happened with Daryl Cooper? So he was interviewed no, by Tucker Carlson, and mm -hmm. uh, he he's uh, you know a guy that does deep dives. He's a hist I don't know if he's like an, a full time historian by trade or if this is a hobby that he does. But he recently was on Tucker's show, and he said regarding World War II, he said that Winston Churchill was a villain. And I mean, people. Oh, I did went, hear that. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And yeah. people went crazy over this. I mean, he was just yeah, vilified, yeah. demonized. It was like you're not allowed to say 
these things that go yes. against mm -hmm. the the mainstream consensus of, of history and what was written yeah, and what right. we're taught what we're taught what we're so you're saying and you're one of these guys and this is probably you know look this guy daryl cooper just got dragged yeah. through the mud he had a 48 hour onslaught of hate towards him and you've been doing mm -hmm. this your whole career where you're questioning you're questioning yeah. the mainstream narrative of what they're telling us but in this yeah. book you go back all the way to the u.s mexican war um <laughs> So you're saying that we, so the lies haven't just recently begun, that this is something that's been going on for a really long time. <laughs> no, we've been lied to from the beginning. And, and it was something like World War II. I, you know, people tell me, uh, my book, Crimes and Cover-Ups in American Politics, uh, was uh, another book where I talked a lot about the World War II, the Allied atrocities. And people, and the same thing with the Northern atrocities in the Civil War. And I can tell people, you know, that doesn't mean I, I'm not coming out as a Confederate. I'm not coming out as a Nazi. I'm, right. I'm just telling you that no, we we're told that they that the side we're fighting did a lot of horrible things, and I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe they did. I'm not saying they're good guys, but I'm telling you, it's easier to find what we did, and we're claiming we're the good guys. And in World War II, for instance, just bombing Dresden alone, you know, most people don't know that's where Kurt Vonnegut uh, got the inspiration for writing Slaughterhouse Five because he was at Dresden and he saw the horrors. Dresden had no military value at all. Where the Allies bombed it, they killed 39,000 toddlers alone in that. And so if that's not a war crime, I don't know what it is. So whatever the Nazis did, that doesn't excuse that. Same thing right. in, in, when I look at, and we document more in this book about um, the Northern atrocities. I mean, it, it's undeniable. They, they raped and they raped every woman they could get their hands on in their march to the sea. Uh, they burned crops. They, they salted the earth so these people couldn't grow food anymore. Uh, they stole everything they could get their hands on. I mean, I, I published a letter from a northern uh, lieutenant, and he said that's the best kind of evidence. It's, the court historians ignore it, but this guy has no axe to grind. He's bragging to his family about how much booty they've gotten. You know, they got all this great jewelry from these women in the South, and he's complaining that General Sherman keeps taking a cut of everything. He's got enough gold and silver to, to start his own bank. That's the kind of history I love because they can't deny that. And, but that's what we were doing. And, you know, I talk about even before that in, in the U.S.-Mexican War, as you mentioned, we saw the same kinds of things. Civilians targeted, uh, women and children stealing. And, of course, you know, they, they've honed it to a fine art during the Civil War. And then we saw the same thing in World War I and World War II. And that's what a lot of this book is about, about the, the things that are the so-called good guys did. And that's why, you know, I, I'm not trying to be unpatriotic, but when you say you support the troops, that means you're supporting what the Northern troops did, what uh, the 39,000 toddlers that were killed in World War II, uh, and, or even going to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. The, 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 we know that the troops there were playing uh, soccer with decapitated heads. I mean, I, I don't support that. And I, I'm just trying to get people to realize, don't mindlessly say, and that's why we keep having these wars, because people don't object to what, I, again, I don't know what the other side is doing. They could be worse. I don't know. But I do, it's easy to document what we've been doing. I think that's the argument. The argument uh, that excuses this type of behavior is, well, the other side is worse. So yeah, maybe we did some bad things, but the other side is just so much more, they're, they're so much worse that we're the side, we're on the side of morality. Yeah. We're the good guys. And yeah. that, I, I mean, it's hard to imagine what is worse than killing 39,000 babies or playing soccer yeah. with a human head. I mean, it's hard to imagine mm -hmm. like, or yes. raping all the women. I mean, what is worse exactly? What did they do that was worse? Exactly, and that's my point is, you know, we, I mean, I, I write, I, I try to write when you know, my, my sub stack is the only place I'm being allowed to grow. Uh, and it's the only place I'm not shadow banned. And so I, you know, I've taken to where I'm trying to write funnier and funnier stuff. I'm trying to write with humor on all this because I think you have to laugh at it. And yeah. so I use that kind of thing where I'll, I'll come up with an atrocity and say, you know, freedom isn't free, you know, that kind of, or, you know, kind of say, what, how else are we going to, you know, what else could we do but rape the women, you know, or, or uh, you know, play soccer with these heads? How else are we going to beat the enemy? You know, to try to make people look at how absurd it is, the excuses that they make. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big anti-war guy. I have, you know, I, I think probably the last war I would have supported was the War of 1812 because we were actually invaded. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't understand why people overlook what happens and so much of our our entire foreign policy is is predicated around war and you see even now we're always on the brink of world war three and you know how many billions are we going to give to ukraine and uh russia's the new boogeyman you know and that kind of thing 
it's we're always ready to go to war. And meanwhile, here at home, we have our, our infrastructure hasn't been addressed for 60 years. You got people living in the streets and in tents. And uh, you've got migrants being held in five-star hotels. Now in Chicago, you've got apparently migrants taking over apartment buildings and they may have to rely on the Hell's Angels. To, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, right. you can't even write satire about this stuff. You know? <laughs> what do you think it is about historians that are not, why are they not covering this? Um, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's historians, this is a form of journalism, right? I mean, it, it should be mm -hmm. objective. They should be just telling the truth. It's historical journalism. Journalists cover usually what's happening now, what is, what's, you know, the, the, the current events, but a historian should be doing the same work as a journalist, doing the investigation, going in yeah. deep diving into this stuff, figuring out what really happened, and then just writing the history, not putting a spin on it, not omitting or editing history in order to fit a narrative. Why do you think historians have, uh, and it seems like that, now we see a lot of the journalism being edited, right, by the mainstream media. We see that they curate, and that is a giant problem within journalism. But there's still a strong independent journalist section, you know, segment of the pop of the journalist population, and even some mainstream outlets. You know, I will say, like during COVID, the Wall Street Journal I felt like was very fair and balanced. Actually, it was like the only one, in my opinion, that when I would read, I would get a variety of opinions, including the opinions that were completely censored by every other outlet and, and by doctors who were totally demonized. So there are some mainstream journalists and outlets that will still allow the dissenting narrative. But when it comes to historians, it's, you know, like what we just witnessed with Daryl Cooper and saying Winston Churchill was a villain. I mean, it, it seems like they have real manufactured consensus inside of the historian community. What do you think it is that is created that yeah well i think again i, I look at history i call him the court historians as a tip of the hat to professor harry elmer barnes he's a hero of mine he was a, a many what many classic liberals I, i'm a classical liberal really but uh that existed back in the 1920s he was in all that he wrote for the nation and all, all the you know big periodicals of the day but he made the mistake of suddenly looking at world war one and saying you know God, there's so many millions of people died, and I don't know why. I, can, I literally can't find a reason why this happened. And uh, they drummed him out of polite society. And uh, we talk in American Memory Hole about how FDR invented cancel culture. Now, I don't know if FDR uh, actually canceled him, but he invented that process long before social media. So Harry Elmer Barnes was a victim of cancel culture. He couldn't write for newspapers anymore. He couldn't write for magazines, and he couldn't get on the radio, which that was the media of the day. So he, he wound up his life uh, talking to historical revisionist conferences. Same thing would happen to John Toland later, who, wrote, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, wrote a big book about Hitler, but he made the mistake of writing a book called Infamy in 1984 about uh, Roosevelt's obvious advanced knowledge of Pearl Harbor. He was drummed out of polite society, Pulitzer Prize winner, same thing happened. He ended up uh, having to talk to the historical revisionists. So no one else would happen. And that's what happens. The, the historical, uh, the court historians, you're right, they brook no dissent at all. And uh, I use that term because he did, but they're, they're the gatekeepers of the past. So they serve the same function as the so-called journalists do today. They're gate, the gatekeepers of the present. So when we see in a current event that happens, any current event, uh, it, they frame it. They come up with a narrative and people like me, you know, the thought criminals, uh, you know, it might, it, you know, we, we come up with, we easily dissect it and show how this is impossible. I don't know what happened, but this didn't happen. And, uh, but they just ignore us and we don't have the kind of platforms. Uh, so we can't counter them because to, to debate these people would be a child's play because they have no facts. All they have right. is their, you know, their, ten, their, their tenure, they have their tenure. They can't be fired. They're making good money and they have impressionable young minds who don't know history. So they mold them so they can tell them Lee Harvey Oswald killed JFK. And they can tell them all these absurd fairy tales that have no basis in reality because there's nobody, there's no Don Jeffries or anybody like me sitting in the room that said, wait a minute, that's a lie. You know, that's, that's not based on the facts. And that's, I think, again, because we are run by this, you know, people say, you think everything's a conspiracy. And I said, well, you know, yes, I do, because I think we're being run by conspirators. They fit every definition of that. They conspire against the public over and over again. And they're so committed to these lies and these false narratives that, for instance, in the, when I was writing Crimes and Cover-Ups, one of the people I corresponded with was uh, John Wilkes Booth's great, 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 great grandniece or something. He didn't have any 
kids. But uh, they were trying to get his body exhumed from the Baltimore Cemetery where it's buried because a lot of people think he didn't die in Garrett's Farm and he escaped and lived for another 30 years or something. They had a mummy that toured the country that was claimed to be John Wilkes Booth's body. Well, the family wants it exhumed. Usually in those cases, the family's wishes are granted. Not in this case. The National Park Service has been blocking them. Why? Because they're so committed, even if they found that wasn't John Wilkes Booth's body, which I think it probably isn't. It would, that wouldn't affect our politics today. I mean, it ha would have no impact at all, but it would be just one of their many little lies that they promote. And they literally don't want to admit they're wrong on anything. So, and, and you go back even farther than that to the early 1800s, Meriwether Lewis of the Lewis and Clark expedition. I, again, I corresponded with, uh, I talked to uh, his great, 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 great grand nephew, the same thing. They've been trying to get his body exhumed because they think he was murdered. He didn't commit suicide. Again, that would have an even less impact on today's politics, but the National Park Service is blocking it. So, I mean, it's an easy way to prove that it's wrong. Hey, just you know, show us, show us where, that some, these people were stupid to say John Wilkes Booth didn't die. Just this very easy way to prove it. You have DNA technology. The fact that they don't invites these so-called conspiracy theories because wh wh why wouldn't you let that happen? If, if this right. was a John Wilkes Booth, a, a nobody, sure, the family wants it exhumed, we'll let it happen. But they don't want to consult the historical mystery. So that's when I look at that, I, I try to tell people, if you wonder why something like COVID, you know, and I wrote, I wrote a book, Masking the Truth, how COVID-19 destroyed civil liberties and shut down the world. I, they, they have done things with that book you wouldn't believe. I mean, Amazon disappeared the Kindle version. Barnes & Noble disappeared both versions. There's no explanation. Apple Books was trying to charge $999 for it. The libraries have blocked it. It's, it's been amazing. Even the mo most of the alternative community hasn't, hasn't been receptive to it. But something like that, they're committed to such a huge lie that has affected so many millions, they are never going to admit anything, even though they now we have so much evidence that vaccines have caused all this damage that they're not gonna admit it. And uh, so if they're committed to that, the fact that they're committed to something as small as Meriwether Lewis or John Wilkes Booth, it shows how committed they are to all this. So when somebody says, when this guy says, uh, Winston Churchill was a villain, which I think he was, he was a drunk warmonger, you know, to be honest with you, but he, and he loved bombing people, but, you ought to be able to say that regardless, but that's how committed they are. Oh my God, everything. How dare you say that? You know, what do you mean? He was part of the glorious, you know, he was, he was, uh, you know, he gave that great speech and he brought down the iron curtain and everything, but that, that's how committed they, they will not accept any kind of dissent on these issues unless they decide, like if they decide to go after Thomas Jefferson, one of my heroes. So when Fawn Brody back in the uh, 70s or 80s wrote that ridiculous psychoanalyst, uh, analytic bi biography of him, and decided he wasn't a hero. And then they started claiming he had, you know, had sex with his slave and everything. Sally Hemings, uh, they, they all believe that. That's cool. Well, that revisionism will accept because it, you know, it, it ends up denigrating uh, the father of liberty, the, the, you know, the first champion of free speech and all that. So um, obviously I, I don't have uh, very much in common with real historians. And if they, if they did talk to me or debate me, the first thing to do is ridicule me for my lack of formal education. And, but that's why I mention it all the time, because I, I, I won't give them that opportunity. I say, yeah, I'm just a community college dropout. What do I know? But I'm pretty sure that I can debate you effectively. Hey, guys, this was just a clip of a longer show. Catch the full show by going to KimIversonShow.com. It is free. It airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You could go back now and watch this full interview. I highly recommend it. Again, go to KimIversonShow.com. Thank you so much for watching.